and I was writing. Huh. I was writing about uh, free will, and right as I oh. wrote free will, I stopped. Something happened. I was like, hmm. "On, do we have free will? Who told us we had free will? Where is it? In what? I I don't know." So my question was, "What do the um?" extraterrestrials do they honor our free will um, and now a new question is do we have free will or is that a construct of something i don't know well pat that's a great question i've started a, a list of additional questions uh for the uh the next version um and i'll add that to the list uh and independent of ai that's always been the question for the psychics, um, I want to think of, you know, Joe McMonagold and others uh, who have posed Dean Radin, et cetera. Do we have free will or not? And um, or is everything predestined? It is still a, a conundrum and enigma uh, in society. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Cloda, I see you have your hand up. Hi, thanks, Paula. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, did you see the movie Oppenheimer? And uh, if you did, what did you think about it? And um, if you haven't, maybe you can't answer this question, but I was fascinated that Christopher Nolan portrayed uh, Foo Fighters in, in some of the scenes. And, and I just wonder if he's done some research or if that was part of the, the novel, American Prometheus, because I haven't read that novel yet. Um, that's a great question. Uh, I, I have, I've in fact seen it twice. Uh, I once saw it with uh, my family because I took my uh, kids and, and wife to it. Um, and then I flew to Newport Beach where my father lived and took him because he was a theoretical physicist and it took courses from Hans Bethe uh, at, at Cornell, who's portrayed or mentioned in the movie and very much, I mean, he's 95, very much lived that. Um, it, he wasn't involved in the program per se, but um, he was close to it. I don't know about the Foo Fighter mentioned. I haven't read the novel uh, that's supported, but I, I think it's, you know, it's clearly in the popular buzz at the time. Um, uh, you know, people talk about artificial satellites uh, not being flown till 55 or 56, but in the early 50s, they were all the rage on front cover of Time magazine and in the newspapers and uh, it was the technology was coming. Um, so I, I enjoyed the movie. Um, and, you know, it's a little long, but then again, it was uh, it was great to see it with with my dad and hear the stories about, well, when I was taking this, you know, class. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions about artificial intelligence in general? Because uh, this is a, a subject we should be talking about. Okay, David. Thank you. So, you, you know, when I first saw the title of the book, I thought that's more where the direction was, is, uh, and I think it was uh, Richard Dolan who kind of put the idea in my head that suppose we're getting to a point that, and some of this I'm gonna combine with, you know, theorizing what you were talking about or the concept of the uh, non-soul disposable uh, clones that they're being controlled by the artificial intelligence that really is what's behind this whole thing. Uh, or one of the whole things, if we assume that there's different whole things. So, and, and you could kind of um, see where we're going as humans, as this thing is developing so fast that with the lack of privacy and everything intertwined, that 
we were able to build clones or whatever that could do the physical work, building crafts, whatever that uh, that we as so humans with souls that are going to be, you know, that are going to be obsolete. Uh, anyway, uh, my mind's running kind of, mm -hmm. you know, but so conceptually, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's an interesting uh, hypothesis. Um, it, one of the ways to do, I think there's a there's a question in the book about um, the nature or technology of the craft, and you could make a craft that's sort of a hybrid biological. Um, well, that's entity, what Corso, yeah. Corso said, which always stuck with me. Well, I was in the electronic component distribution business, so. Uh, a capacitor for those, a capacitor is a device that stores electricity. That's in all of our devices, you know, electronics. Mm -hmm. And Corso seemed to think that the EBE was the capacitor of the functioning as a capacitor in the in the vehicle. So yeah, I I would go with the skin, but um, it, the the hybrid. It, there's some advantages to being more biological and less mechanical. I mean, the ability to self-repair uh, that even humans have with an immune system, um, the ability to, um, to to maybe travel farther because they can self-repair, you know, rather than uh, if you get a hole in your ship from a, a meteorite or something, you, you may not be able to repair as well. And the other thing is that you know, we're, we're making integrated circuits and electronics and, and semiconductors, and they're doing a certain part of, you know, mathematical functioning, but um, they cost a lot. And less in humans, um, you get so many, so many synapses and so much compute power, in theory, um, and visual spatial cortex in a biological entity that's more compact and efficient than takes less energy than uh, a traditional mechanically oriented system. And I think uh, if I was to bet, uh, I would bet that um, these craft or many of these craft are uh, biological hybrid situations. And I'll share just one story. Um, I had a remote viewer target the Tunguska uh, crash of event or explosion. And uh, his response was that it was a, a giant mm -hmm. biological craft that ex exploded for you know what it's worth. Hmm. Interesting. So Ryan, the thing is that even though the discussion on artificial intelligence, I mean, a lot of people, uh, even in the panel that I did in Laughlin, uh, were saying they were really uncomfortable with that. Um, it, it, don't you agree that it's better to really study this and control this and than to totally ignore it? Because, you know, countries like China and and Ying Pei, my assistant, was talking to you about this. Are using it so much in so many ways that uh, uh, unless we uh, you know go to school about it also and not use a fear factor, uh, it's much wiser for this country uh, to to try to look at it. Well, uh, I I agree, Paula. I mean. The, um, you know, the ostrich approach of just uh, burying your head in the sand is is not a good idea, is that, I mean, I agree with Elon Musk's comments about um, AI safety and good ethics and consideration of the ethical challenges of artificial general intelligence and so forth. And I think that there will be some good guard, guardrails put in place. But I also believe that... Uh, um, China will not follow those, uh, nor will, uh, you know, Afghanistan or Iran or whatever. The genie is out of the bottle and it's going to get smaller and more compact. Um, 
a recent uh, conversation with uh, Altman, uh, who's the head of OpenAI, he says that, you know, our reasoning is getting better and better. We're, we need less data to train on to have a better response, is that if I spin the dial of life forward five years, I would say that we're going to have um, on our laptops or cell phones a very powerful AI that you just simply talk to and, you know, you don't have to drive the mouse anymore. Uh, maybe you do, but it, it's it's going to be uh, more prevalent everywhere. But fundamentally, humans are better at many things. They're better at uh, empathy, and they're better at uh, interpersonal relationships, and they're better at psychic ability, and they're better at um, compassion. And there are it's a tool that will help us. It's not going to take over. Um, I'm less fearful of that. Uh, so I, I don't know. Hopefully that was uh, answered your question, Paula. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, you know it's a it's a big question mark. But I agree with you about the ostrich. You know, putting our head in the sand and not finding out about it. In fact. I'm trying to find out as much about it as possible. Can you raise your book, uh, Ryan? Because it's not, it's readable. It's its not that, yeah, it's readable. Uh, you know, well, we read it, we read it like in 24 hours. And no. I, yeah, because it's readable. And can you talk a little bit about this? Are you thinking of a second version? And if you are, what? how would you feed the AI? Would you ask different questions? How would you do it? Well, uh, I, when I'm in sort of a collection mode right now, I mean, um, the the question about free will is a very interesting one. Uh, the question uh, that actually uh, your your friend, your Chinese friend, uh, sort of urged me to think about in the Einstein Oppenheimer document about the legality of of a relationship and communications with. Um, extraterrestrials. So I'm I'm sort of gathering other questions from other ufologists um, that they want to have answered, and I and I want to try to um, maybe add additional references to uh, the book. Um, but I'm probably going to wait a year to gather more insights and, and then refresh it um, with uh, with better AI and with better questions. And um, and hopefully it will be um, more useful. Okay, are you going to go to any conferences uh, in this year? Because you kind of dedicated yourself to aerospace, your company, uh, the the Cold Fusion Company. Uh, are are you going to appear anywhere? Um, it, it's actually Hot Fusion, but it's okay. Oh, it's Hot it's Fusion. Not... Maybe it's not, not, not cold fusion. Uh, it's, it's proton lithium fusion for the people. Oh, are. okay. But um, the answer is yes. I'm I'm going to uh, MUFON in uh, July in um, Dallas, Fort Worth uh, as a conference. And that one is I'm signed up for um, and contact in the desert. Now I was um, waiting for that. I was waiting yeah, for contact. I'm on, I'm on the I'm on the agenda for contact. Yeah, but... Um so those are the two ones that are are my schedule. Uh I will say that I'll be on uh, uh George Nori on Monday evening. Um and uh Linda Howe is uh we're recording a session um tomorrow and it's going to drop on Wednesday I think uh so I'm I'm sort of doing a little bit more but you know I I still have a full-time day job where I'm trying to make a difference in fusion and having small compact portable uh fusion uh sort of suitcases or roller bags um uh, that are fundamentally 10 to 100 times cheaper electricity sources than uh, all other types of energy. 
And th this is just as transformative as, as ET anti-gravity or something. Um, so that's um, what I'm, I'm working on during the day, during the day. Well, well, I'm glad you're going to be more public and I'm on coast to coast Sunday night. You know, it's all, it's so late at night, but I'm going to be talking about your book. I told you that because I, I'm an educator and I believe people should read everything. Otherwise, how in the world are they going to make any decisions about anything if they only read their own book? So, uh, yeah. so I'm going to mention you on George Nury, and I see that Pat has her her hand up. Pat, did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you, um, Ryan. Can AI tap into something beyond what it's fed? Technical? Can it go into the collective consciousness and pull from there? Since consciousness seems to be evolving at a very rapid pace, maybe we don't know where the two might meet at the end. Or... It, in a practical sense, no. I mean, it is only knows what it's been trained on. Um, however, you know the the people like Dean Radin or, or others that have studied uh, psychic ability and psychokinesis have. Um, taken integrated circuits and um, change their bits and influence them. Uh, the human mind can influence the electronics. Um, and that's certainly possible, but I'm, I, I have no way of believing that uh, it can do anything, tap into anything more than what it's trained on. Uh, now, if you were to give it a organic brain mind meld uh, or use uh, uh, Elon Musk's Neuralink in the future, I mean, they're planting uh, computers into the brain and you can control your hands and so forth, um, but maybe going the other way, um, just hooking it up to a human being and having it record or monitor people's thoughts, it might learn something. But this is all speculation on my part. I, I have no, you know, I would read science fiction, but- uh, Yeah, I think, uh, I, you know, I still have that memory of uh, 2001, take a stress pill, Dave, take a stress pill, you know, <laughs> because it monitored the tone of voice of the astronaut, uh, Hal, the computer. Uh, I, I, ironically enough, Hal, the computer, if you take every single letter after that, H is I, A is B, and L is M, it's IBM, <laughs> if you look at that. The computer in the in the 60s was IBM that was control that not only killed the astronauts of Mord, but it was it was you know it could monitor the tone of voice. I think that that's what science fiction did. It did a little disservice to us because it makes us believe that whatever you know, like the Terminator is has its own mind, and so people aren't you know educated enough to to go for it. Uh, to study it, and and they should. And Paul, did you have your hand up again? I do. I yeah, do. Go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, um, I, as we've been involved with Paula and Boulder Exo, the uh, evolution has been uh, away from phenomenon and, and, and um, uh, hardware and craft, which is interesting, of course. But uh, we're more interested increasingly in what does it mean where does it place us in the uh, cosmos, the local universe, uh, and the limits of consciousness and how that consciousness ex expresses itself? And uh, increasingly, I'm coming to believe that consciousness is a function of everything, not just biological. And so you mentioned the biological ships or uh, what I am getting right now myself is that more there are more biological integrated ships than there are hard metal 
inanimate ships. And so my question, I guess, is where is your understanding in uh, what these uh, crafts slash beings might be? We think about a droid or an, you know, a, 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 a ex exploration craft that comes down and lands here on Tatooine, you know, and starts looking around. But uh, I'm, I'm increasingly beginning, beginning to believe that they are uh, more conscious than we have given credit for, just like humans tend to discount anything that's not human. You know, I mean, do, do, do dogs feel pain? You know, these stupid kinds of questions that we carry sometimes. So uh, there's a question in there somewhere. You can probably answer anything and come out making me better. Uh, so I'll let you throw something yeah. in here. Yeah, that's uh, that's a sophisticated concept, Paul. But uh, I, I guess the crash is that I've seen and have documented in the book tend to be more uh, hardware oriented craft. Um, but with you know the biological advanced biological entities in inside and I, I just think that they're so far advanced you know it's it's like you factor of a thousand increase in memory and the factor of a few hundred increase in intelligence and designed for space travel uh, and, and maybe in fact you know they're different species have different goals um, from the greys being, you know, the, the typical uh, droid-like tool to maybe reptilians or Pleiadians or uh, any other species that you want to be more uh, higher consciousness. But again, I don't, I don't really have any data. I was sort of focused on, you know, the things that I'm good at are government documents, and UFO crashes, and and now more about uh, how to use AI to to create a blueprint of understanding um, of of what to do. Um, so um, I, I you know I've been around the sci process and world. Back to Jack Hauk and his spoon bending parties, and um, I think I went to spoon bending party three hundred and thirty five or something like that, and it was interesting. And um, I did a software program called Psychic Jackpot, which was about training your mind to be more psychic by guessing random number wedges, and then statistically analyzing it, um, and and then. I, I've been exposed and I was recently deeply fascinated by uh, a podcast by Dean Radin on the UFO rabbit hole um, where he talks about uh, nature of magic, M-A-G-I-C, rather than J-I-C, which stands for Military Assessment of the Joint Intelligence Committee, uh, in my case. Uh, and, and some of his technology and ability... He's working on a nasal spray that you can improve your memory and uh, dec decrease um, uh, anxiety for mental illness by modifying genes in your brain. Uh, but he also, in time and money, uh, could modify it to make you more intuitive and more psychic because they analyzed... Um, the famous intuitives, not only Ingo Swan, but Joe McMonagold and a bunch of other people and found um, genetic differences and tuned into this sequence of a hundred or so genes that um, are related to psiability. Uh, so anyway, that, that was what fascinated me uh, today, actually yesterday, um, in relation to, to Cy. But that's sort of a long-winded answer. Uh, hopefully it was new, fresh information. Well, listen, I am so grateful to you. Uh, I am very, very grateful for your contribution to 
uh, this kind of a classroom, uh, and I, I love master classes because they're classes uh, and, and it's interactive. So I wish you a lot of luck. I wish you luck on, on uh, Monday night with George Nury. Uh, and, uh, and I hope people see you at Contact in the Desert, but I'm glad you're becoming more public, Ryan. Thank you for your contribution to everything. Well, thanks, Paula, for hosting the, the podcast and uh, or the, the Zoom. And I'm glad I got a chance to answer people's questions because it's, it's really about getting people to, you know, ask questions and get their answers. Everybody has their own perspective and interests. And they're all quick like throw in a thank you to both you um, and, and Paula, too, that uh, you're you're credible, you are grounded and you're sharing your truth and uh, sharing it from your perspective that you understand, not reaching beyond what you really don't know. And I just thank you both for the work you're doing. Well, thanks well, so much. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. you.